Um, what are we doing now? We've got uh, third, fourth, fifth grade, and junior high. You guys are dismissed to go back to your classrooms. Thanks for joining us. If you are going to be following along in a Bible, maybe you brought that. We're going to spend the bulk of our time in Philippians chapter 4. Maybe you didn't bring a Bible. That's okay. It'll be on the screens for you. You can read along. So glad that you guys are here today. You ever have those, um, those moments where you pray for something, but you don't pray specifically, and then God answers in a way that you didn't expect him to answer? Anybody? Or is that just me? Am I the only one? So I've been struggling this week to figure out a, uh, um, an opening illustration. This is, is somebody, uh, somebody asked me earlier in the week, hey, man, hey, how's your week going? Um, and, and I was very real and honest. This has been the worst week of my life. Um, for those of you that are unaware, a member of our church, one of my good friends, uh, last Sunday at 1022 went to be with the Lord after a three and a half year battle with cancer. Um, you know, and a year ago when we were planning out the sermon series, um, and, and we do, we, we plan out these series like a year in advance. Like we're already working on 2024. Um, I'm already thinking about 2025. And, um, and so I was like trying to come up with an illustration. Um, typically I, I try to find a funny illustration, kind of break the ice for newcomers. Um, you know, I, I think I'm a funny guy, and so I try and find that. And so in the middle of the week, I was really struggling. Like, um, I, I just had some moments where grief was uh, was threatened to overwhelm me. Um, it, it happened when I was getting my hair cut. Um, I just, the, the poor gal that was cutting my hair, I just started crying. And uh, she's like, is everything okay? And it's like a free counseling session. I mean, I just started pouring out. <laughs> And then I was uh, at the dentist on uh, Thursday. Well, and then Wednesday afternoon, um, well, while I was getting my hair cut, my daughter had an asthma attack at school. Uh, she was trying to beat a pacer test, which she did. So if you see Harper, tell her congratulations. She got an A in PE. Um, it only cost her a 911 dial and the fire trucks and ambulance to show up at the school because her O2 levels dropped and her uh, inhaler quit working. And uh, I'm in the middle of pouring out my heart to the poor 19-year-old gal that's cutting my hair, and Becky calls, um, and all I can hear through her gasp is, Harper's not breathing, they've called 911. Um, and so, like, I literally jump out of the chair, and I'm like, I gotta go. She's, it's a miracle she didn't, like, cut my neck because she was giving me a straight razor shave, and I just literally ran out of the door and just wiping stuff off my face and, and came in, went to the dentist on Thursday, um, and again, and, and, and I love my dentist, he's a believer, and he's asked how it was going, and I, again, broke down and started crying. Um, and, and I went to see him because, uh, and this is where the praying for something not specifically, and the God answers in a way that you don't want him to answer, comes around. I'm going to bring it full circle, just, just hang with me for just a second. Um, so last year, 18 months ago, uh, when I was in high school, I got into a football accident, and I killed my front tooth, Okay. Uh, hit it and, and it was and it's just been dead. It's been a little off colored and so like 18 months ago, I went and saw a dentist, got it pulled and 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 got an implant put in. Uh, they were putting the implant in and the dentist torqued a little too hard and broke the implant and so then they had to do a bridge. And uh, uh, last night as I was driving back at Cooper, what time was it? Like 10:30 from the Young Life banquet, my bridge fell out. So uh, today you have Pastor Bubba. I'm missing my three front teeth. That's okay. God's got a plan. And a year ago, as we were getting ready to start this series on November the 4th, I was like, it's Thanksgiving. We should preach, preach about gratitude. And on Monday, as I was writing the message, and as I was even picking out uh, a year ago, the verses that we were going to use for this section of Scripture, um, I think you'll find that it's pretty apropos Um what we're going to read about. This one, I don't know if this one will be on the screen, but 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and 18 says this, Rejoice always, even when your front teeth fall out. It doesn't say that. I added that part. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, even when your friend passes away at 20 and he shouldn't. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So 
And then we jump to Philippians 4. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And look how he phrases that. I am to be content. It's a command from God to be content in every circumstance. So we're going to talk about how to do that today. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This perhaps is the most misused, misquoted scripture in the entire Bible. It absolutely, it, 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 hands, I think it's the most misused, misquoted scripture in all the Bible. The high school football player needing a first down to win state in the huddle. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. To the, the, the CrossFit athlete trying to finish that last round of the workout, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. To the busy mom of three, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. To the dad working to save his job, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This verse isn't meant to be uh, some little thing that you pull out of your back pocket and you dust off when you, got, when you need God to do some kind of miracle for you. When we treat God that way, when we quote this verse, when we need God to do something for us, what it, what it actually does is it cheapens our relationship with him. And it begins to discredit in your life what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus didn't die on the cross to be some personal genie in heaven for you that when you really need him to move, you dust this verse off and you wipe it off and you're like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What Paul is saying here is much deeper than that. Warren Wearsby says it this way. It is, on the contrary, a detachment from anxious concern. Listen to what he says there. It's a detachment from anxious concern about the outward features of Paul's life. This in turn arises from his concentration on the really important things, the invisible and the, e and the eternal, which he talks about in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. And above all, what Paul is talking about here is the closeness of his fellowship with Christ, whose strength he constantly draws upon. So what Paul is saying here when he says, I, I, I know how to be content or I am to be content. I've been high, I've been low, I've been hungry, I've been well fed. I'm content by, because Christ strengthens me. Is it's, it's turning away from the focus of the outward earthly things that seem to inundate us all the time. Hello, fallen teeth out. I'm afraid to see the picture that my wife draws from the message today when she takes notes, she doodles. And I guarantee you there's going to be this big caricature of me Man, that was a tough word with three missing front teeth, but I got it out. And it's going to be like, and she, I promise you, it's going to be like Pastor Bubba, and he's going to be missing three teeth. It's not focusing on those things, and it's turning and focusing on the closeness, the invisible, the eternal, those things that you have that are yours as a follower of Jesus. My good friend and mentor, Pastor Toby, says it this way. He's diagnosed 25 years with a massive anxiety depression issue. This is what he says about this when he, when he talks about it. He goes, I have discovered through the course of my life that I don't have an anxiety issue. He says, rather what I have is, do I trust God when the anxiety sets in issue? You get what he's saying there? He's not, he's not saying that he doesn't have anxiety. He acknowledges that. He'll talk about it with any and everybody. He is overwhelmed at times with anxiety. It's a struggle in his whole life. The problem isn't the anxiety. That's the outward. The problem is, do I trust God when the anxiety sets in? Do I trust God at the end of the month when the bills are still coming in and the bank account is slowly going down? 
Do I trust God when I get news from work that doesn't make sense and I've got to shift and, and I've got to go do this when I didn't think that I was going to have to do that? Do I trust God in the middle of my college studies when I'm unsure about whether I'm going to pass a class or not? Do I, do I threaten to let that, that feeling, that overwhelming sense of, of, of the precipice of falling over and failing overwhelm me and impact every area of my life? Do I trust God when my spouse and I are on the outs and we're not communicating and things aren't clicking the way that they should? Do I trust God when my grandmother or my grandfather passes away or, or my friend dies in a car accident? Do I trust God in the middle of all of the things of life that threaten to overwhelm us? It's not a matter of being okay in the middle of our difficulties. Rather, it's a matter of understanding who's with us in the middle of those circumstances. It's the Philippians 4.13 mindset. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I can do all things because I have a closeness of relationship with him. And because he's close, because he's with me in the middle of that storm, I know that I can weather whatever life throws at me. You guys get what, he's, you get what I'm saying? Okay. Now let's get to the message. That was just extra. What Paul is telling us here, really, I think it really comes from, from, from verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He said those first one, two, three, four, five words, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. What I think Paul is telling us through this entire section of Scripture in Philippians 4 is this, that gratitude really is all about a positioning of your heart. Gratitude is a position of your heart. Gratitude has nothing to do with your circumstances. Let me say that again. Gratitude has nothing to do with your circumstances or your station in life. And I think uh, everybody, if you're writing, stop. I want everybody to look at me. High school, college, retired, working, kids that might still be in here, babies. He, that's my favorite, man. He always at the perfect time says something. Hi. Hi. Oh, I scared him with no teeth. He started, I started crying. Now, uh, uh, from, from today, through the end of the year, it is more important for you to understand this th than any other time of the year because you're fixing to be inundated. Uh, corporations and companies are going to spend billions of dollars over the next six to eight weeks to try and convince you that your life only has value and meaning if you buy their product and you open their gift on Christmas. Not just companies, your kids are going to try and convince you. I, you anybody get the Amazon uh, thing like two weeks ago? Conveniently, Harper found it and she's been circling stuff and it always ends up like, y'all, I'm kidding, I kid you not. I've thrown it away twice and it always ends up back in my car. Gratitude has nothing about what you open on Christmas. Gratitude has nothing to do with, about like what kind of car you drive or what kind of house that you're in or anything like that. Gratitude has everything to do with the position. Consider Paul who says that. I rejoiced greatly. Consider the things that he went through. He lists it out in scripture. I, I, I've shared this before. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. If you do know it, I'm going to repeat it. If you don't know it, maybe you should take note. So the guy that says this, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. I rejoice greatly. Uh, for the cause of Christ, as he, as he shared Jesus with people, these are the things that he went through. Uh, five times he received 39 lashes. 40 was a death penalty. If you got lashed 40 times, you were considered it dead because you couldn't come back from it. It's the same thing that Jesus went through at his crucifixion. Three times he was beaten with rods. And we're not talking about like uh, like my grandma used to do when I was little. She'd make me go get a switch. Anybody get, get, a, anybody get a switch in? Get a, kids, you guys have it easy. When I was your age, and I kid you not, it happened when I was 16. I smarted off and she said, go cut a switch. And I said, excuse me? And she looked at me and she said, go cut a switch. And I went and got a switch. And she switched me in front of like 50 people. What you do is you get a little branch and you cut it off about the, the width of your, I'm, 
talking over here because all the kids are sitting over here. Well, there's some over here too. Sorry. About the width of your pinky. And um, you were hoping you were wearing shorts because if you didn't, she'd pull your pants down so she could get at your legs and, and she'd switch it. That's not what Paul did. What Paul is more like bamboo rods. More like the size of a fist and guys would just line up and whack right in his back and across his legs. He was stoned with rocks once. The Jewish people stoned him and left him for dead. Three times he was shipwrecked. Uh, once he spent an entire night and day adrift on the, on the open ocean. Y'all, I can't think of anything scarier than being adrift on the open ocean. Man, that just scares the living daylights out of me. He says that he was in danger from natural disasters. He was in danger from friends and enemies. He was in danger from false accusations, from hunger and thirst, sleepless nights, anxiety and depression. The bottom half of that list sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? I mean, I've never been uh, lashed, or, or I mean, I've been switched, but I've never been beat with rods. Certainly, if nobody's ever helped me with rocks. I've never been shipwrecked. I felt like I was adrift on the open ocean for a night and day, but false accusations, hunger, thirst, sleepless nights, anxiety, depression. But I can identify with that. But gratitude has nothing to do with our emotions or, or, or how we're feeling or what life is throwing at us. Gratitude has everything to do with the position of our heart. When my heart or when your heart is positioned at the center of your universe, gratitude is something that's very difficult. It's difficult because everything in life revolves around what I want or what you want and what you need. And when you're sitting on the throne of your heart, gratitude is not something that's readily available for you because everything in life is about how it affects you, how does it inconvenience you, why do I have to do this or why do I have to go through that? Gratitude has everything to do with the position of your heart. Gratitude has more to do with how we react to situations than our gratefulness for something that's been given to us. Listen, I get stuff all the time, and I'm thankful for like uh, uh, this last month. I, I, I've been, I've got cards. Uh, Becky and I were blessed with with uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, gift cards to some of our favorite restaurants. I got some incredibly uh, beautiful, sweet letters from people in the church. I got a uh, a coffee mug with some really cool fish on it. We got all kinds of, and I'm grateful for all of those things. But true gratitude, th this deep, guttural bedrock of our lives has everything to do with who's setting on the throne of your life. If you're at the center of your universe, this, in the long term, is going to be impossible for you. You're not going to be able to practice gratitude. But when the occupier of your throne, of the throne of your heart is right, when God sits on the throne of your heart, choosing gratitude is easy, even in difficult circumstances. Because one of the other things that we learn from Paul is gratitude is a choice. It's not a byproduct. Gratitude is a choice. It's not a byproduct. It's a choice to say that I'm thankful. It's a choice to say, God, this doesn't make sense. God, I don't like what I'm going through. You could even tell God that it's not fun. You could even tell God, hey, you know what? I am angry that I'm going through this, but yet I praise you. It doesn't matter what's happening around you or I. We get to choose to be grateful. Shane and Shane, I don't know if you listen to worship music, but Shane and Shane is one of my all-time favorite bands in the world. They have a song. You can go look it up on YouTube. Make sure you listen to the John Piper version. The song is called, Though You Slay Me. And it's echoing what David writes in the Psalms that if you take everything from me, if you take God, if you take Becky, if you take Cooper, if you take Savannah, if you take Josie, if you take Harper, if you take them all, yet I will praise you. If you take everything from me, God, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to have gratitude because gratitude is a choice. It's not a byproduct. We choose to be grateful. Paul says at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, I, I read it this way. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says in any, every circumstance, we're to choose gratitude. 
Now, let's be honest, it's not easy, is it? It's hard, it's difficult in, in, in difficult seasons to choose gratitude. That's kind of where the rubber meets the road. That's kind of the, the idea of the Christian life. It, God's purpose for your life is to not make you um, uh, 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 comfortable and happy. His, his purpose in life is to conform you more to the image of his son. He wants to make you look more like Jesus. And often that refining process happens in the valley, not on the mountaintop. And valleys are hard. Valleys are difficult. They're not fun at times. But it's where growth happens. You know, if, if there was... Uh, if there, if there was a pill that would solve problems, like if it would help you with your sleep and your mood and your immunity, like if if there was a pill that that would do would would improve those things, your sleep, your mood, your immunity to certain diseases, if if it would help decrease depression and anxiety and problems with chronic pains, and it would decrease the chance that you could get the common cold or a flu, and and it was like that it. And it, and it came out, and it, it, and it, was, it was tested. It was, we would take that, right? That, that would be like a good thing. If, if there was something that could do all of those things, we, we would do those things. The Mayo Clinic did some research over, over 25 years, and they found that gratitude does all of those things. It's not a pill, but it's a practice. If you're like, dude, it's amazing. Like The Mayo Clinic does this big, long study, and they, they release their findings like this is something amazing like new evidence that they found and you go back to scripture and Paul writes about it 2,000 years ago the, their study should literally shows that if, if you express gratitude it helps improve your sleep it puts you in a better mood it's hard to be in a bad mood if you're grateful for things it just is just like it's hard to be mad at somebody if you're praying for them I don't know it helps with your immunity literally Physically expressing gratitude helps improve your immunity and your ability to fight diseases. It helps decrease depression and anxiety. It helps with problems of chronic pain and the risks of disease, and the list goes on. When you choose gratitude, it also helps you become more resilient, which helps you recover from trauma faster. People that express gratitude after trauma recover faster than those that don't, that just sit around and like, oh, Woe is me. Why me? We, we know those people, right? We don't like to be around those people, do we? Let's just be honest. i got to get going. People who practice gratitude are often perceived as more trustworthy and they extend trust to others more quickly. Not only this, uh, if you express gratitude, you're more likely to be able to solve problems faster. Now, if you're under the age of 18, or maybe let's go 25 because we've got some college students, Learn from us older people. Practice a life of gratitude. You should, just, you should just be thankful. Man, if nothing else, just wake up in the morning and be like, man, I'm glad I woke up today. Because it's not promised to you. Practice gratitude. Because here's the other thing that we understand and what we learn from, from, from Paul's writing in Scripture is this. That gratitude turns whatever you have into enough. Gratitude turns whatever you have into enough. When you practice gratitude, you begin to focus on what you have and not what you don't have. If you're always focusing on, on what you don't have, you never have enough because you always want more. But if you start to focus on the things that you do have, the things that God has given you, life gets a whole lot easier. You begin to focus on what you do have versus what you don't have. This last week, I got to, I got to go over to a, a friend's house. And, uh, um, and here's the thing. Like, I'm going to open up the curtains maybe a little bit, and, and maybe I shouldn't. Um, my family, as much as I... Uh, I wish we were on the early end of like decorating for things. Often we're on the the we're on the I don't know like a week and a half before. So, um, how many people like have your house like decorated for fall? Hands up. 
you got like a mat out, you got some nice stuff in the bathroom or something like that. Anybody have Christmas decorations up already? Amen. Amen. Come on. Amazon Music has already started pushing Christmas music into my playlist. I love it. I mean, if you're, if you're in the Christmas mood, Bebo Norman's Christmas from the Realms of Glory doesn't get better than that album right there. If you can't remember that, come find me after church. I'll tell it to you. I was at a friend's house. Becky and I, we, we got to go uh, hang out for, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes at a friend's house. And, and it was all decorated up. It was super nice. And um, they had their TV, right, and, and their entertainment center. And you know, like, I, I, I got a picture. Put the, do we have a picture? I think we have that. Did we get that picture fixed? Yeah, okay. And right, look at all those cool decorations. They got pumpkins and all that kind of stuff. You guys see what that says? What's it say? What's it supposed to say? And we're sitting there. Isn't it awesome? We're sitting there, and I'm looking at it, and Becky's looking at it. And I don't know if it was like an agreed agreed upon discretion, like we chose not to say anything, because it's like one of those things, like who am I to judge? Ant-Man. I mean, it's not who I normally think of in the fall, but I mean. And so we're sitting there, and I'm not really paying attention because because a uh, husband and, and I, are, we're watching basketball, uh, and, 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 and the wives are sitting in between us on the couch, and they're just talking 10 miles an hour. I mean, they're 100 miles an hour. And dad's slowly turning the TV up so we can listen to the game. And they're just getting louder. And it's this competition. And I looked across behind their heads and looked at him and kind of gave him the knowing nod. And he finally muted it. And, uh, and Becky was talking um, to the gal. And she saw us looking at it. And she goes, I know, it's supposed to say autumn. <laughs> and we're like, so why doesn't it say autumn? And uh, anybody have annoying teenagers that live in your house? So there's this, can I tell you, in the continuation of Ant-Man, can I tell you a really funny story? We've got a couple of minutes. Can I, can I share a story I wasn't going to share? So Becky and her brother, growing up, <laughs> they played this game one time at, at mom's house. And the goal was they were getting ready to leave for youth camp, so they were going to be gone for a week. And so they decided what they were going to do is they were going to turn every picture on all of the walls upside down. But the trick was, mom, my mother-in-law, Lois, sitting right there on the second row, had to be had to be in the room when they did it. That's what I'm talking about, annoying teenagers, okay? You guys know what I'm talking about? So this is supposed to say autumn, but the teenager in this house flips it to Ant-Man. And it became a point of contention between mom and daughter. Mom would flip it back to autumn because it's supposed to be autumn and that's the decoration and that's what I want. And daughter would flip it back to Ant-Man. And Becky and mom are talking. And she's like, so uh, do you need? Do you want me to go, do you go flip it? And she goes, no, I don't flip it back to autumn anymore. I leave it at Ant-Man. And Becky goes, like any mom, like every mom's like, why? Like you're giving up the fight. Like this is a power struggle. This is like the Treaty of Versailles, World War II. We got to figure out who's going to win this thing. And mom says, in like this super profound moment, I don't know how long she's going to be here to flip it from autumn to ant. So I'm going to enjoy it while I've got it. Gratitude turns what you have into enough. Because you never know. You never, never, never know when what you have is gone. When the person sitting next to you may be gone, it's not promised. But when we practice gratitude, when the position of our heart is proper, when we acknowledge Jesus on the throne of our, of our heart instead of ourselves, God is in control, and when we practice gratitude, more than enough. The worship team is going to come up, lead us in a song.
It might be familiar to you. You might have heard it. If you haven't, that's okay. It's a really simple song to sing. It's entitled Gratitude. I'm going to invite you to, to stand up if you want. You don't have to. You can stay seated. You can lay, raise your hands. You can whatever. And if you know the song, you can sing it with us. Maybe you find yourself today in a place of not practicing gratitude. Today is your opportunity to make sure that the person that's sitting on the throne of your heart who should be there, that's not you.